Hey, this is Troy Taylor with the Championship Football Coaches Clinic on Totem Pole Sports. I got my longtime friend, Brad Bradley, on the show today. And I just want to tell everybody the first time I remember you, Brad, I don't know if you remember this, but Scott Abel put on a coaches clinic in Charlottesville. And it was probably like 2001 or 2002. You probably remember the year. But, you know, Coach Abel, who's the head coach at Davidson um, College or University, he put on a coach's clinic and it was in a hotel. And you were actually in a hotel room speaking about your offense. And I always know that somebody get, is giving a good talk when – after they get done, I like que I question how much I really love football. And I I haven't done that very often. You know, John Gruden, I was like, wow, like football oozed from him. But like football oozed from you when I heard you speak, you know, about your offense. So do you remember that? I do. I do, I do actually. I remember the clinic. I, I don't remember like, you know, everybody being in the same room. If they were listening to me, they probably had nothing else to do that day, I guess. Uh, but uh, I do remember the clinic. You know, Abel's a great guy. You know, Abel was over here at Amherst right next to us for a long time and did a tremendous job at Washington Lee and has done the same kind of job over at Davidson, done a really good job. Yeah, they made it to the national playoffs. And I've been watching a lot of podcasts. So this is kind of like, you know, just us talking about football. You know, we're, we're both football guys. And, uh, you know, I, just tell the clinic a little bit about your background, Brad, like, you know, where you grew up, where you've coached, where you played ball, all that. For those I'll, start that out, I'll start out with my background with my dad and my uncle. My dad uh, was a high school football coach for basically 41 years in the state of Virginia. Wow. Um, actually, two of those years were in Tennessee at Sullivan East was his first ever coaching job. Wow. Uh, before him, my grandfather uh, coached, I want to say 30 – Five years, 36 years altogether. I think uh, 29 of those was his head coach. The rest of them, he finished his career at Virginia High as an athletic director. A um, couple of things my grandfather was known for. He won a state championship in 1963 in football at Graham High School. He also won, that was in football. He also won a state championship in 1965 in basketball. And then when he went to um, uh, Virginia High, uh, he was actually the athletic director and was responsible for putting the pool in the, the uh, they were building a new school then and got the pool built and they still have a pool in, in, in Virginia high, high school right now. That's part cause of him. And they used to share a stadium and he got stadium built at Virginia high a long time ago, back in the early seventies. Um, got three generation football coach. My uncle actually was in Hinton, West Virginia. They still, they got the, 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 uh, 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 I'm trying to say the, uh, the, the stadium named after him. He coached for 25, 30 years. Uh, so it's kind of been in my blood. But, you know, kind of, I guess, my beginning, my, my dad um, was the head coach, was an assistant coach at Grundy High School all the way up until 1980, 80, 81, and um, took him to the playoffs for the first time in a long time. And I think it was 80. It was whatever year that Giles won their first state championship under Ragsdale. Uh, quick story about that. My dad and Ragsdale screaming at each other uh, at the beginning of the year. And, and dad's team was going to be pretty good. Ragsdale's team was going to be pretty good. And they scrimmaged and I, they scrimmaged at Grundy and dad beat Ragsdale. I think, I think dad's team was like scored six touchdowns, five touchdowns to none. Ragsdale got him on the bus and was mad after the game. If you know, Steve Ragsdale, you know, legendary coach in the state of Virginia. I actually got the honor to coach against him back in 2005 and 2006 when I was at uh, William Campbell, but uh, he got him on the bus and he told him, he said, we just got our butts kicked. You know, you just came down here to Grundy and got your butts kicked. Well, season went on. I think Giles ended up maybe undefeated. I think dad ended up eight and two. Unfortunately, at the end of the season, uh, right the week before the playoffs, my dad had two, uh, two football players, both starting guards on his team get killed in an auto accident on the way back from Virginia Tech. Man. So they played Giles again in the first round. You know, the kids got killed on Saturday. They had the funeral on like Tuesday. They play on Friday. Not an excuse. And Giles was a really good football team, won the state championship, but they got beat that year. I think it was 24 to 6 or something like that. But, you know, dad always likes to.
Yeah, I don't know, Coach. Uh, I'm going to add him to the stream. Let me see, y'all. So, Coach, I'm going to have to tell him when he comes back on, you know, if he's using his phone or his laptop, you know, he's got I gotta make sure that he turns off all the, the windows, but he'll come back on here soon, y'all. I don't know, that might have been my fault. I'm not sure. But here coach is back. Hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's yeah, I don't simple. know if that was you or me. No, that was me 100 percent I've got three American bullies, and one of them came through the here, and my, my computer's been dead, and he ripped the uh Corner huh. thing, and I, I didn't know it was out, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, what I was gonna say, um, you, you know, we, we, it's just one of those things that you know, that was kind of the first big job I remember. My dad, I was on the sidelines the whole time. Um, during that, how job, old were you then? I was hmm, 1980, so I'm 49 now. So, what was I? You're five years older than me, so I was born in 78. I was born in 73. So 80, I was like seven or eight years old, seven years old. And we still got video of that game, pouring down rain game. And I couldn't even get on the bus because I was so nasty because I've been playing, you know, backyard football in the end zone. You know, I was back in the days when kids run wild and do whatever you want to do. And uh, I was playing backyard football. And I remember my dad had to make me change my clothes, put them in bags and everything to, to get on the bus to go home to Grundy. But, uh, and that was the first that was the first job that you know my dad really had as a head football coach and uh, he left there in uh, 1981 he became the head football coach at Lexington and uh, he was only there one year and uh, they had a really good year took them to the playoffs I think they end up uh, they, they beat Botetite that year I think or it was a close game I can't remember that's back when they had Elton Tolliver at Botetite and uh, they end up losing to Perry McClure and mm. good story about this. My dad was a passing team back in the day. Now, and Grundy, he never never threw the ball. It was straight T, I, power I, whatever, right? And he gets over to Lexington. He had some athletes. He had a really good uh, uh, quarterback. Pug, uh, 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 Pug Merchant, Merchant was the uh, uh, receiver. Dad gone. I can't remember the guy's name. He's now, he's now at Rockbridge. He works at Rockbridge. He's a basketball coach at Rockbridge right now. But anyway, he was their quarterback. And dad could sling him. He was slinging the ball 21, 22 times a game. Well, they get playing in the, in the playoffs, and the, the, the lights go out in the stadium. And only half of them come back on, and they're at Lexington. Well, the athletic director at the time decided, look, we're going to go ahead and play. Well, you know, if you're a passing team, you only got half the lights on one side of the stadium. <laughs> you're not going to be a very good passing team. And he was playing Premier McClure back in the day when Coach Williams used to be there, and they never threw the ball one time. No. I remember well, watching him play Appalachia when I was a kid. Tom yeah. Turner was the coach. Yeah, I coached against Buena Tom Vista. Turner. Coach against Tom Turner myself. So, um, but yeah, man, I think he threw the ball. I think they threw the ball one time, you know, and that can throw it in that beat. Um, and then basically in 1981, 1982, Willis White calls my dad and I asked my dad to come be the middle school coach at Salem High School. Just taking over the job there. And uh, he, he hired my, my dad. He hired John Hinkle, which at the time had been at Royal Retreat. Um, and a couple other different places that was a head coach, hired my dad, hired, I think one other coach had head coach experience and um, kind of put together the, the dream team. And uh, Billy Miles was on that team or on that staff. And uh, my dad took the job, left Lexington, was the head track coach, the head wrestling coach and the head football coach at, at uh, Lexington. And um, basically took about a, got about a twenty seven thousand, twenty eight thousand dollar raise to go to Salem. Wow. So we weren't he wasn't making anything at Lexington. So we go to Salem. And uh, I was at Salem basically my eighth, ninth, seventh, eighth, ninth. I think I think I got there in the seventh grade. So I was there seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Before that, though, I went to four different middle schools or four different elementary schools. Sorry. And uh, in my life, before I got to college, I'd already moved about 23 times. Because 23 of times. Being Is a that coach just because your dad was a coach? Yeah. I mean, some of those were, you know, we rented back then. So, you know, sometimes you'd have to move here and move there. Uh, we were in Grundy. We got flooded out one time. Um, but my dad coached it. Uh, since I've been alive, he coached at um, uh, Wiffle, Grundy, Taswell, uh, Sullivan East, and then, uh, you know, th then came over to uh, Salem. 
So, you know, we kind of moved around until we bought our first house when we got to Salem. And, you know, I remember now, coaches didn't make any money back then at all. And um, so, you know, I, I remember, you know, we didn't have anything. And uh, it, it was, you know, we were happy to, to, to have a roof over our head and those kind of things. We took the job at Grundy. Uh, he got a nice single wide at the top of the hill overlooking the football field. We thought we were in heaven. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then, we, like I said, he bought his first house. We moved to, to Salem and we were there for a while and I graduated from there. Um, and, you know, that's how I kind of got kind of excited about football with my family. And then for myself, I ended up playing in Salem, had a really good career there. We went to the state championship in 1992, no, excuse me, 91. And we got beat by, um, uh, we got beat by, uh, Spotsylvania in 1991 in state championship game, got beat 31 to 27. We were 13 and 0 going into that game and lost. And, uh, you know, that's a heartbreaking loss period to the end. And, um, you know, at, at that time I was getting recruited. I wasn't anything special. I was just a, a, a good white possession wide receiver. I had some good speed. I made the state finals in hundred my senior year. I think I got sixth or seventh in a hundred. Um, you know, I, I was proud of that. I was third on my team. We were as a team, we were third in the hundred, uh, four by one relay team that year in the state. Um, you know, so I had some speed, but I was getting recruited by Richmond. And back in the day, I give it, it's, I guess my recruiting story, I tell to the kids all the time, everybody, you know, kids have a feeling nowadays to kind of, you know, feel sorry for themselves. They don't get recruited by this team or that team. And everybody wants to be division one. Well, no, there's no change back in the day, but Richmond recruited me, recruited me, recruited me my whole junior and senior year. I'd gone to receiver quarterback camp there forever. Well, come, come time to actually, you know, sign um, the night before, basically they, they, they reject the, they, they pulled the offer. They had two kids that were 6'2", 6'3", that wanted to go to Richmond. So, you know, I'm going to be left out in the cold. Here I am, 5'7", if I'm lucky. Um, and, uh, you know, so I kind of got left out in the cold. So my dad and I went on the road, man. We started traveling and, and, and uh, visiting Division II schools. And uh, up until that time, I had perfect attendance my 7th, 8th, 8th grade year, my ninth grade year, my 10th grade year, my 11th grade year. We took 37 days, I think, my senior year to go look at schools. Wow. And finally, one day. I ended up at Glenville State College and fell in love with Rich Rodriguez and what he was doing and the passion he had for the game. Um, and uh, just, you know, I had probably better offers financially, uh, but he put me on a half scholarship my freshman year. Uh, my sophomore year, I earned a full scholarship and I uh, played there for four years and graduated. I was a four-year letterman there. And, um, you know, I learned a lot of football, man. Learned a lot of football under a lot of really good football coaches. All that staff alone, at, at, at Glenville State College, um, I had um, – I'll tell you what, I'm going to – my coaches are bugging me to death about getting the link, so I'm going to uh, take a picture and send it to them on group chat if that's okay. They can leave me alone. Um, but uh, we had Herb Hand on staff there, which is now offensive line coach. Um, where is he at now? He's at uh, Central Florida. He was at Texas. He was at Auburn. He was at Penn State. Awesome. He was at, at Vanderbilt. He's been everywhere. Um, we had Dean Hood on that staff. Dean Hood is now the head football coach at Murray State. He's been at Kentucky. He's been at Eastern Kentucky. Uh, he's been at Wake Forest. So he had no, we had him on that staff. Um, we had Tony Gibson played for me, played, excuse me, played with me, and uh, also was a GA before me. And Tony Gibson is now the defense coordinator at NC State. We had Rod Smith, was our, my quarterback. My, well, he was a junior when I was a senior. And uh, Rod Smith's now been the offensive coordinator at a, a number of Division One teams, uh, such as uh, Michigan, Illinois. Uh, right now, he's at Jacksonville State. He was at Arizona. He was at West Virginia. He's been at Clemson. He's been a little bit everywhere. So we had all those guys on one staff. <laughs> so you imagine that hotel room you were talking about earlier. We had that every day in our dorm rooms and our houses. It was just a really good football environment. And I learned 90% of my football at Glenville State. And was Rick Trickett, was he the O-line coach? Rick Trickett was not the O-line coach when I was there. Rick Trickett uh, at that time was basically at Florida State most of the okay. time in Auburn, in Auburn, I think. Um, Rick Trickett came after me. Um, uh, Rick Trickett, when I, I, I was actually, um, after I finished Glenville, I ended up ga and for, for Rich Rod after I finished playing in, that, in 95. I ga for him in the spring of 96. And in the summer of 96, I'm working down at the Parks and Recreation in Salem. The phone rings. I had no, I had a cell phone, but we didn't really use them back then that, like that. And uh, it was Rich Rod. 
And Coach Rich called me and said, hey, man, you need to take this high school job over here. I said, what do you mean? I'm going to come back and GA for you. Well, at the time, at WU, there was no online classes in 96. You couldn't do it. You couldn't do a, you know, a master's degree online. So I would have to have physically driven to Morgantown to do the master's degree, which means I wouldn't be able to GA because the class, the way it worked, just what conflict of interest. Plus, I still had a semester to go at Glenville to finish up. I had to do my student teaching and some other things. So he knew I kind of wanted to dip my toe in, in, in the uh, head coaching or the coach in high school also. And he said, listen, you've already done, you've already been to GA. You know how things work here. Here's this is going to be your GA in terms of a um, uh, high school job. And I went down and interviewed for the job. When I actually interviewed, I had just turned 21 years old or I just turned 22 years old. Wow. And um, I interviewed for it, got it <laughs> in late May, early June of uh, 96. And I uh, went down there beginning of 90, or July of 96. Didn't have a place to live. I lived in the field house uh, right there at the stadium. It had a, it had a, had a room, that had an air condition. And uh, coached there for two years while I went to school. I worked construction to make a little bit of money. I had a $3,000 coaching stipend. That was it. And, um, you know, we, we, we took a program there that had been really at the rock bottom. What uh, school was it? Gilmer County, West Virginia. Gilmer it's County. Right there in Glenville. It's right there in Glenville. And uh, we, the first year we were three and seven, but we did establish the first ever JV team in, in the history of the school. Uh, the second year we were five and five. And uh, we lost three games that year by less than five points at the end of the game. You know, I mean, you know, we lost by, by five points or less uh, three times. Uh, we ended the year with a huge upset over Braxton County, which is a double A team there. And uh, they were ranked like, like number six in the state coming in. We knocked them off. We didn't make the playoffs, but it was a great game. It was in the, it was in mud. I mean, it was horrible mud. I did a Pete Rose slide after I shook hands with the coach, you know, those kind of things. Um, and so I was at Gilmer for two years and uh, a lot of fun, man. I learned everything, though. I was the offense coordinator, the defensive coordinator. I washed all the clothes. I lined the field. Um, you know, I did everything. Um, I had one other guy on staff. He worked at the local jail. You know, on Friday nights, as soon as he finished, he had to get to work. So we didn't want those Friday night meetings on Sundays. You know, he would come in, for, you know, as quick as he could. But, you know, it really wasn't where we're at now. Um, so I'm getting ready to start my third year there in 1998. And um, I get a call from Tony Hart. Tony Hart was then the head football coach at Lord Botetop. And Tony Hart calls me. This is late July, man. This is 20th of July, let's say. <clears throat> calls me up, asked me about coming up for an interview and for an offensive coordinator job and a teaching job, which is my first teaching job. I mean, you're looking at a $35,000 pay raise because that's what it was going to start at, about $30,000, $35,000 in my football and everything. I went up there, got the job, and uh, had to tell my team at, at uh, Gilmer County because we started a week earlier in West Virginia. I had to tell them basically the day before the season started that I had, you know, that I was leaving. And it, it, it was bad. You know, that, that really wasn't the best circumstance. Uh, but they understood, and I still – I've got four or five of those kids are on that team that still come to a lot of my games these days. And I had one of them that now um, during COVID, we didn't play. They play. I got a chance to see his son play two or three times. And his son's now uh, uh, competing for a starting quarterback job at the University of Charleston. So, you know, that shows my age. Um, but was at bottom top for two years, uh, 98, 99, under Tony Hart as, as, as the uh, uh, offense coordinator. We were – we were seven and four the first year, got beat by Rustburg in the first round. Uh, quick story on that. We lost our running back second play of the game. I threw the ball like 65 times <laughs> in that game against Rustburg because we couldn't run it. Uh, but we lost. Next year we went seven and three, missed the playoffs by a tenth of a point. Um, so we, you know, we were, we had pretty good we won 14 game there in two years. And then I got an offer uh from Rob uh, oh, excuse me, Rob Arnold was the principal at the time at, at William Campbell High School. I've never heard of William Campbell. Calls me up, got my name from Buddy Show. Buddy Show was a big guy from Radford at that time that knew my dad, knew me. Uh, my dad was highly involved in wrestling and wrestling camps, and Buddy was involved in those things too. And uh, Buddy, he asked Buddy about who, who who he should hire, and he said, "I got know, I know a guy you might want to give a chance to." I drive all the way down from uh, from Roanoke to William Campbell for the uh, interview, and I thought I was going into the middle of nowhere in God's country because in Naruna you can't get there from here. That's just how it is. And got there, and three and a half three and a half hours later, interview. I got offered the job the next day, and took that job. And you know, the rest is history. We won ninety three games there in nine years. 
won a state championship in 2002. We were 14 and 0. We actually beat Tom Turner's team in the state championship in Appalachia. That was, I think, their second to last year being in existence. Um, I got a great story about that later on. What was the score of that game? Ah, I knew you'd ask that. 70 to nothing. What well, didn't Appalachia? Appalachia had beaten. Was it William Campbell before, or was it Middlesex that they had beaten? They had beaten seventy-seven to nothing, or something like that. <laughs> Who did they beat seventy-seven? I to can't nothing? remember. It was a couple of years before us. Uh, but what people don't understand in that game is we scored three defensive touchdowns in the second half, and second period never carried the ball after the third quarter. But another thing, not making excuses, we only had thirty-two kids on the team. That's it. After my eleven dudes, I mean, we subbed in the fourth quarter and this and that. Um, but I'm going to tell a story, and Tom Turner, you know, he's head coach at, at Union, great guy, or not Tom, Travis Turner. Yeah, Travis. Tom's son. Tom's son, Tom's son. He knows mm-hmm. his story, and I'm not I'm not going to step on anybody's toes. But Tom was old school, man. Tom was old school. So oh, yeah. That was back in the day when you sent a scout to the game, and they're playing Bath County at UVA Wise. We just won our game. Oh, we were at Matthews. We won our game at Matthews. And we're all the way on the coast, and they're over there at UVA Wise, so – my coach is over there. My coach called me and said, Coach, he ain't going to trade film. I said, well, he ain't going to trade film. He said, Tom Turner basically said, F you, he ain't trading film. And I said, well, put him on the phone. He, he, he answered the phone. Who is this? He said, you Burrheads, you Burrheads grand, uh, uh, grandson. I said, yes, sir. He said, we don't trade film here. And I said, well, we, we, I'm asking for two films. I'm giving you two films. He's got two films to give. We'd like to have two films. All right, we ain't giving no damn films here. We ain't <laughs> he ain't doing that shit. So not only that, he hands the phone to his principal. Principal tells me he ain't handing no damn film out. We don't do that shit here. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. Okay, whatever. So you know how it is. My, my dad knows people down in Southwest Virginia. I know people down in Southwest Virginia. By the, night, by the end of the night, my dad had driven to Southwest Virginia, right? And he had gone and gotten, I think, six or seven films. I had another one of my coaches go to a couple places that said that we could pick it up. By the time we started our Sunday meetings on Sunday, the next day, now I remember because we all played on Saturday, I had all four, all 13 of his films. You know, <laughs> Tom Turner wasn't the most liked guy in the world. I understand that. But anyway, we beat him. I shake his hand. And this is the class act Tom Turner was. He pulls me tight to him. He said, look here, you little shit. He said, I got much respect for you. Your grandfather would be proud of you. He said, wow. I, don't, I respect you. And, you. and that made me feel like, you know, hey, man, some of these old school guys, you know, un- understand because – if you give in to them, they're going to take you for everything you got. If I'd have just been like, you know, I'd have gotten intimidated by that, he'd have no respect for me in the, in the whole world. Yeah, uh, just like Kobe and Michael Jordan. I mean, exactly. they say it all the time. Exactly. Those guys exactly. Would, would test you to see what you would do. Yeah, and, and, and you know, we, we, we knew we had a really good football team. I might coach the rest of my life and not be as talented as I was in 2002 state championship team at William Campbell. Unbelievable, Coach uh, Taylor. I mean – we, we had a quarterback that was right at – he doesn't get credit. He should have gotten credit. His total yards were 4,000 and like 22. But when the official stats came out, he only gets credit for 3,991, which is crazy. That made Vic Hall, our rival right in that same district, was the first ever quarterback to go over 4,000. You see what I'm saying? So, But I had a quarterback that was amazing, Shea Boy. I had Cedric Pyramid on that team. We had a kid named Vernon Vassell that might be the best athlete on that team and never got the credit. Um, and we had a left tackle that had a vertical of 47 inches. I mean, it was unbelievable. We were the most athletic team that I have had since I've ever been coaching, no matter what level. And uh, I just had to make sure I, I, I got out of the way. I got there when they were sophomores. And if, if, we'd, if we'd have messed it up uh, uh, their senior year, they'd have had to fire me because I'd have been a dumbass and I would have ruined it. Uh, but, you know, we were there nine years, won it again in 2005 with a bunch of overachievers. They probably shouldn't have won it, uh, but we had good leadership. Uh, kids like Matt Barber, Danny Brogdon, which is now the head football coach at William Campbell. Uh, Matt Barber, which played at UVA, was a little All-American there at UVA Wise. We had a kid named James Haley. Um, we, we had just really good players, and, and they were tough kids. And they really exemplified what we tried to put out in terms of our toughness. Um, you know, and, and then after that, but was there nine years. My superintendent was leaving. My principal was leaving. I made the mistake going to Patrick Henry High School in Roanoke. Great job with the kids. Just didn't really get along with with, with the administration, with the AD. She never had a uh, – she's still the AD there, but never had a vision of what I had a vision on, what, what, what our football program should look like. 
felt like we turned it around. We were three and seven the first year, six and four the second year. And then I left and went to a million. That's when I got to meet you a, a little bit more. And you and I had a lot in common. You were at a million. I was in a million. And uh, me is a different place. Am I right? It's a, it's a totally different place. And I, and I, you know, we got lucky. We had some really good athletes right there. And they were just looking for some direction. And, uh, you know, we made a good run. Got beat in the state semifinals that year. And then uh, I got the job here at Heritage in 2012. And I was at a million in 2011. And I've been here for 11 years. And uh, we've been very fortunate. We've won 111 games. My dad just sent me the stats the other day, 111 games in 11 years. And we've been to the state championship four times. We won it in 2018. Uh, we were runner-up in 2012 to uh, Browood, which we didn't have a chance. Uh, you know, Trace McSorley was their starting quarterback. The next That's year, good. the next year, you'll appreciate this. The next year, we were here at three or four together that year. The next year, we went to three. They went to five. They got beat in the state finals, L.C. Bird, yeah, the next yeah. year in 2013. And, uh, you know, they were like 2,700 kids. We had like 950 to 1,000. Man, that, that was wild. Yep. I mean, why in the world? Who thought that was a good idea that teams with 2,700 should play 1,500? And HSL. I mean, it, <laughs> I don't know. But talk, talk a little bit for the younger coaches or the guys that want to be a head coach, talk a little bit about the importance of having a supportive administration. And in an interview, you know, can you be fooled? Can, can they tell you that they're going to be supportive and then they aren't? And should oh. you look at a track record or tradition or just talk about that, the importance of that? Let me tell you something. I mean, I used to be the young guy on the block, and now I'm definitely one of the old guys on the block. And, uh, you know, I've, I've interviewed for my share of jobs in this state and outside of this state and other places, so on and so forth. And um, I definitely think that there's a couple things you have to have in place to have a very successful football team. And number one thing is administration. you got to have an athletic director, a principal, and, you know, sometimes if it's a smaller community, you better have your superintendent on board. Um, if it's a bigger community, they might not, they can be a little bit more detached, um, but they still have to be involved and, and they got to understand the importance of athletics. Um, been really lucky here. I've had the same principal for 11 years here at, at uh, Heritage High School. The main reason I've stayed here, um, probably the 100% main reason I've stayed here. Tim Beatty is one of the most supportive administrators I've ever been around in my life. I've been very fortunate. Tim Beatty, for 11 years so far, and Rob Arnold at William Campbell for nine. And if you do the math on that, that's 20 years out of my 25 years as a, as a head football coach. I've had really good administration. The reason they're important is because you're going to need them to back you. There's going to be something that's going to come on their desk that maybe you didn't do exactly right or maybe somebody didn't agree with you or whatever, and you're going to find out if they got your back. You know, it might not be something you did wrong, like a behavior situation. It might have been that, you know, you're, you're, you're holding steady on, on I'm not going to talk about playing time. All right. And uh, I'm the head coach. I can reserve that. Right. I'll talk to you about what your son can do to get better. But I'm not going to talk about playing time. So if I talk about playing time with you, then I'm talking about some other kids, some other kids playing time. And that's not fair. And at the end of the day, as coaches, we got yeah, we got favorites. We got favorites, the dudes that can play, the dudes that work their butts off, the dudes that commit themselves, the dudes that 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 are 100% dedicated to your program. Those might not be your best athletes because 90% of the time you don't win with your best athletes. You win with your best kids. And the best kids are the ones that buy in. So I think administration, man, they got to back you on stuff like that. And, and if you got guys that are going to back you or, or, or women that's going to back you, makes your job so much easier. Also, in high school, you know, your resources are limited. Um, you got to have you got to have a principal that, that's willing to do things to to uh, to help support you and your kids. And you're going to have the most kids of any program in the school. You're going to be the face of the school. You're going to be the attitude of the school. You're going to be the heartbeat of the school. Every principal that I've ever met that, that understands football will tell you that if you open up your school year with a really good football year. All right. And your team had a really good year. Guess what? your year is going to go smooth. It's usually going to go a lot smoother. If your football team was bad and you had some bad things going, next time it might be a little bumpy. Your football team sets the stage for the rest of the sports season, I think. 
And um, and you know, and I know your football coach is also going to set the tone for you got the most kids walking through the hallways that they're doing the right thing. And they're what we call OKG guys, our kind of guy. Instead of kid drops his books, instead of making fun of him, you help him pick his books up. Right. If that's happening with those kind of kids, that's going to be contagious to all the other kids. And, um, you know, I definitely think that's important. I think athletic director is huge, huge. You're going to work directly with that athletic director on a daily basis. My athletic director, Dennis Knight, um, for the last six, seven years here at, at Heritage has been unbelievable. He was an old baseball coach. And, uh, you know, we might not always agree on everything, but we're always on the same page and we always got the same goal. And he's always there to, to, to make sure that I got what I need and, and uh, I, I got his back. I'm also now the assistant athletic director here at Heritage High School. And um, but you got to have a good one, man. If you don't have a good one, it could be horrible. You know, that's one of the things that Patrick Crane, I just never felt like we had support um, from that level, from from the athletic director level or the principal level. And as a result, I just felt like we could never really get going. You know what I'm saying? I just never felt like we could ever get going and in, in what we wanted to do. And, um, you know, it, it, it was a holdback. If you got people that are willing to help you get there, you're going to get there a lot quicker. And it's going to be like a family, just like your team. If you got a staff that's not on your page, probably not going to be the best staff that you can get, right? But if you got everybody on your page, they've got your back, and they they, they understand. Yeah, you're going to let them coach. You're going to let them do things that they want to do. You know, you don't want yes guys, but you also want guys that are going to have the same mentality, philosophy of the program, and what the program's uh, goals are on and off the field. Guess what, man? Those guys are going to preach the same thing you preach. They're going to coach the same things you coach going to have a really good freaking chance to win football games. And I think it's the same way with administration. Um, I think you definitely can be fooled. I definitely think you can. I, I think that not that unfortunately there's a lot of administrators out there that probably athletics, especially football might not be on their, on, on their agenda, you know what I mean? High on their agenda. And I think that, you know, sometimes that maybe, maybe they can act like it or this and that, and, and it doesn't happen uh, period at the end. Cause Either you got somebody's back or you don't have somebody's back. You know, it's a pretty daggone clear and, and, and narrow line. Uh, and when you find that AD principle that, that, that's really good to work for, man, it makes your job a whole lot easier. And it makes it a lot more fun. Am I right mm -hmm. about that? Yeah. <laughs> You've been in the same situation I have. Yeah, and I mean, I've been in a lot of different places. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but my dad's from Appalachia. Oh, really? I did not know that. Yeah, my dad, he, he played for the Appalachia. And he uh, played for Teddy Bear Clark. I guess he was the coach before Coach Rick. Yep, yep. It was was the coach, and you know, my dad. He tells these stories about you know the coach made him walk back from pound because you know they only won by thirty. Yep. You know, they it was in <laughs> they was in uh, in Kentucky. I can't remember the place, but the guys came out of the coal mines, and the co coach told them that they couldn't put their pads on until ha halftime. Yep. Uh, you know, stuff like that. But, uh, you know, my, my dad, he left um, – my dad was from Appalachia. He left in 10th grade to join the Marine Corps, so he never went to college. And then my mom's uh, dad, uh, his parents came from Poland. They from they were from Masontown, West Virginia. Yeah. So, I guess my, basically – My people are from – my parents both are from Bluefield. Bluefield, Virginia, Bluefield, West Virginia. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess – my mom and dad's family got out of the coal mines and you, you both of your, um, you know, your grandpa and your dad were coaches. So they must've went to college. So how did they, how did they get out of the coal mines? Well, my, uh, my mom's dad actually was an insurance salesman um, and was, was, was in world war two, came back, sold insurance, did a pretty good job. He actually ended up taking his own life as a result of some of the things that happened in World War II. So I never really got to know him. Um, you know, my dad's dad, the one was a coach. He he actually he spent time in World War II. He was a dive bomber in World War II. I still got a nice little patch and a, a, a jacket that he had. And, and, you know, he was a dive bomber. So he would go down, he would he would dive straight down and come right back up, drop the bomb and, come and climb right back up. <laughs> and um, he did that for three years. He was stationed out of the Philippines most of the time. And um, so he spent his time in the military, went to Concord, went to the military, went back to Concord, finished at Concord. Um, and then, you know, got the job over at Graham High School, stayed there for a long time. I think there was one coach between him and Carla, if you remember Carla. There was one guy for one year. So it was my grandfather, one guy for one year, and then Carla. Um, my dad, you know, 
he never really was in the coal mines because he was a coach's son himself, kind of knew what he wanted to do. Yeah. My dad started out his playing career at Emory Henry. Played for two years, blew his knee out his second year. You know, back then ACL wasn't no wasn't like it is now, man. They cut. Nah. He's got that big cut, that big scar. You know, yeah, he got a zipper. Yep. So he finished at Bluefield State. He actually transferred back to Bluefield State, finished at Bluefield State, um, you know, and then got his first job at Sullivan East because at that point in time, my grandfather had moved uh, over to Virginia High to take that head coach uh, athletic director job. So he moved over closer to him, got the job over at Sullivan East, which my grandfather actually coached at Sullivan East also at one time. So dad took, took a job there as assistant coach. And then, uh, like I said, ended up in Grundy and like I'm wanting to say – I'm wanting to say, I know we were there in 77. I'm wanting to say his first year was 75, 76. We were there in the flood of 77. Uh, that was a horrible situation there. That's where we got flooded. Um, but uh, so, you know, he, he never really was in the coal mines, but it definitely was a part of my my family. Uh, you know, my, like I said, my, my, my mom's dad was in the mines for a little bit, went to the military, then came back, started selling insurance. Uh, but I never got a chance to meet him. Um, but, man, it, it's just – you know, one thing about being a football coach's son, and you know this too, I never ever had a doubt what I wanted to do. I can't do anything else. I mean, I don't. I, if I wasn't coaching football, I might be digging ditches. You know what I mean? I don't, <laughs> I, there's a lot of people that make a lot more money. There's a lot of people that have bigger houses and have better cars and those kind of things. But we don't do it for that. And we can say we do it for the kids, which we do. Don't get me wrong. But I, another reason I'm gonna be selfish. And I'm gonna be honest. Another reason I do it is to stay close as I can to the best sport in the United States of America and the best sport in the world. No other sport can give you what football gives you. They can do whatever they want to this sport. They can try to water it down. They can try to do this. They can do that. It's still going to be the greatest sport in the world because it teaches the most life lessons. Life is not easy. Football is not easy. Life is not always going to go your way. Things are not going to go your way here, but you got to fight. If you fight in both incidences in football and life, you got a chance. And that's why, you know, I, I guess I'm crazy. I could have made a lot more money doing different things, but I really enjoy kids. I really enjoy coaching football. I really enjoy just the right now is my favorite time of year. January through July, I love it. You know, it's kind of like taking clay. And you got this shit ball of clay in, in, in January, and you got to figure out, you got to sift through the shit. And you know and I know you're going to have kids that come in there that don't belong in there and they ain't coming in there, so therefore they're probably not going to be on the team. And, it, and but you get—that's what January and February are for. To me, right till you get to that first dead period, that's what it's for: figuring out who's going to be a part of it. And then once you get your team, now you start kind of—you got the clay. You, you've thrown off some of the ball. You got the clay. Now let's mold this shit. Now let's figure out what we can do here. Now let's get bigger. Let's get faster. Let's get stronger. Let's get tougher. Let's do those kind of things. And then we start putting the time in. And it's not saying we're not doing anything in January, February. I just think there's a lot of. A lot of things that go on in January, February that define March, April, May, June, July. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's the way it's been here. And you know this. We don't have a chance. Yes, everybody's going to get a recruit here or there, going to get a transfer, get this or that. But at the end of the day, man, 90% of what we what we win, 95% of what we win with is what we got yeah. and what we're going to get. And, you know, with all this private school recruiting and all this other crap, at the end of the day, it's still football. There's 11 dudes on offense, 11 dudes on defense, 11 dudes on special teams. And getting those things ready to go and play, that, that's what excites me. It's a great game. It's an yeah. awesome game. So I don't know much about Willis White. I know he won so many state championships there at Salem High School, and then it had a different name too, right? Um, did Salem go by a different name at one time, or was it always been Salem High School? It's always been Salem High School. Salem started – not long before Willis got there. I think Salem started in the late 70s. You have to go back and look. I don't know. I, I might not be right on this, but they hired Willis in 1981. Willis had been – Where did he come from? Patrick and tell Henry. me a little bit about Coach White. He came from Patrick Henry. And uh, don't know the years, don't know everything. I know that he won a state championship at Patrick Henry and was runner-up at Patrick Henry. And he was there with and after a legendary coach. Um, tag, gone. Can't think of it right now. I'm not going to be able to think of it. Um, Merle Gaynor. Merle Gaynor was at Patrick Henry, and he won a state championship there. Coach White was his assistant and took over, and they hired him at Salem. When they hired him at Salem, man, they, they, you're talking about having administration, you're talking about having the backing. They had a mayor, Mayor Talaferro at the time, and he wanted to win. And he dedicated 
He he committed to winning. He he, he got all those, you know, the, the principal at the time, I can't remember who he was, superintendent, whatever, but he got everybody on the same page. And Willis White was able to bring in every single one of his staff, every single one of them. I think Billy Miles was a holdover. And, uh, but you know, he ended up being a great offensive line and offensive coordinator there for years. Um, but he brought everybody in. You don't get to do that in high school. Um, within and the facilities, I mean, what, what were the facilities well, like? Did they have the stadium? No, nope, no, nope. they played at Municipal Field, which is the uh, the uh, minor league baseball t- uh, stadium, not not the new one, the old one. They played at Municipal Field, which is the old one. Um, they built that stadium in 1983, I think, 83 or 85, so three or five years after Willis got there. At that time, one of the biggest stadiums around. Oh, yeah, um, you know, they. Had the best weight room ever when we I mean, that was a, a whole football facility they it had. Is. I mean, it still is. Now I think so who did they model that after? Did they model that after a Texas school? Or I mean I don't know. I think that Willis had Willis was a very, very intelligent person. Uh could do can still do anything he puts his mind to with wood. I mean, can make anything out of wood. I mean anything. So he's still living. Yes, yes, he's still living. Uh talked to him uh not too not too long ago. Uh, he, he's, he, he's had two surgeries, I think with Parkinson disease. Um, you know, he has, he, he, he's got some issues, but no, he's still living and very, very sound minded. Uh, we all had a big thing for him, uh, not too long ago, a bunch of Salem players got together over Mac and Bob's during the season this year. And I got a chance to sit down and talk to him for a little bit. Um, so, you know, I learned a lot of fo- playing football for Willis White versus Rich Rodriguez are day and night. Why is that? What tell me about Willis White? Then we'll get into Rich Rob. But tell tell me Willis what's so White about him. Willis White is very calm. He's very cerebral. Uh, he's very defensive minded. Um, he's very and both them both of them are work ethic minded. But he 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 he's how am I put it? He just he biggest thing he had on offense and defense is we have a base. This is our base. And this is what we're going to do. And we might tweak our base, but we're not going to come out of the base. We're not going to change for you. You're going to change for us. And he didn't mean that in a cocky way. We were old 53 defense back in the day. Now, you know, people like me came along and started spreading that ball out a little bit because when I got there in, in uh, 1998, ain't nobody spread the ball in the Reno Valley. And when we played him in 1999, uh, we had our 19, yeah, 1998. That year I was at Bottle Top. We, we had a good game against him, 31 24. We made him come out of that damn base. We made him come out of that 53. He ended up running more of a uh, a 3 4 type look to get some pressure on us and do some different things. But uh, he just tweaked it, man. He was, a, he, he was a mastermind of the 53. And the 53 defense, man, what he ran was unbelievable. We ran it like nobody else. The way he ran his defensive ends, the way he did stuff with his Mike linebacker. The way he played his outside backers, the way he played, just different than most people I hear talk. Yes, he he was a little bit of a bastard, um, fifty-two monster type thing that he they would throw in there later on. He, I mean, I guess you have to be when people give you like yeah. three by one or give you a pro. Well, eye. later on, later on, that morphed into what he used to call, um, you know, we called it Steeler package when I went to uh, uh, when I went to uh, Patrick Henry and Amelia. Uh, I call it the Steeler package. We still use the Steeler package now, which is more of a three-four type thing. Um, but man, he was just so, I think, ahead of his times when it came to defense. It was unbelievable. Where did he learn it from? Merle Gaynor, I'm pretty sure. He learned most of his 53 defense from Merle Gaynor there at PH. I think he did. Now he's And a lot of it, he kind of put together himself. A lot of tweaks he made himself. And I know that for a fact because talking to him, because when I took the job at William Campbell, I did exactly what he did. I ran the 53 all nine years at William Campbell, a little bit of uh, Steeler with our three, four look my last couple of years there went to Patrick Kennedy and ran pretty much all Steeler uh, with a little 53 mixed in when I got against teams that wanted to, you know, pound it. Um, and then, you know, uh, when I first got to heritage, I ran the 53 slash Steeler. And then we kind of morphed out of it. When I hired Burt Torrance in 2016, we went more of a 43 and now uh, Jay Ferris is my defense coordinator. We're more of a 43, I guess a bastard morphing type thing. We do a lot of different things out of it, um, but we're still a 43 base, but The biggest thing with Willis, man, Willis taught me how to do things the right way. And what I mean by that is, you know, there was just a right way and wrong way to do things with Willis. And and I didn't really understand it. Maybe at the time I was a young kid, you know, and uh, everybody was going to wear the same socks. Everybody was going to wear the same shoes. 
Everybody's going to wear our stuff the same way. There were none of these damn uh, 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 tights on one leg and not one on the other. You couldn't wear shit on your arms. You couldn't do he was huge on that. And I was big, man. I mean, I, I, I would tell him, I got a picture right up here. This is my game right from my refrigerator. They gave me not too long ago. And he wouldn't let us wear black socks. We had to wear white socks. And I want to wear black socks. We all had black shoes. We all thought it'd be great to wear black socks, but we didn't, we voted and it was still white. So we'd say white. So I remember we're playing in the state semifinal game against Lee County at home. And uh, he never really cussed much at all. And I definitely didn't get that from him. And um, so we're playing, and, and he looks down at my shoes. He said, you little ass, what you got on your ankles? I said, Coach, those are wristbands. They ain't socks. <laughs> I'd taken Nike wristbands. I'd put them around my ankles to make them black. And I said, Coach, technically, under our thing, we had a sheet in our lockers that showed us what we could and could not wear. doesn't say anything about wristbands on the ankles. He goes, you little the referees. We got you for that today. Well, see, but they were they were the thick ones though. They were the thick oh, ones. They looked like yeah. socks. And uh, he goes, you little ass. So the next year, <coughs> I was a senior that year. The next year, it listed no wristbands on ankles. <laughs> but I mean, just like stuff like that, man. He also very big on weight room attendance. Huge. Myself and Stephen Magenbauer, which was at Salem High School as a head football coach, we were best friends in, in, in middle school. And we were dedicated to that weight room. We went every day, my sixth, seventh, and eighth grade year. We got a chance to start in the ninth grade. And we did. We both started in the ninth grade. And uh, I took my lumps, a, a little, you know, little corner sitting out there, five foot six, 125 pounds. But, you know, my sophomore year, I had a really good year. My junior, senior year, you know, I was all times laying on both sides of the ball and all state both sides of the ball. But the reason we got to start is because we worked. And there might have been some guys that might have been better, of us, better than us uh, ahead of us. But then he put the time in the weight room and we got a chance to start. And that's where he I realized right then and there, man, he rewarded hard work. And it might not have to be the best player like we talked about earlier in this podcast. It might not be the best player. It was who worked the hardest. Yeah, he he didn't reward the talent. He he reward he rewarded the process. One thousand percent. And he had you know, he, he never embraced the term, process. He never used terminology like trust the process, you know, stuff like that. The savings made huge and, and popular. But that was definitely Willis White. Trust the process. And now to me, you know, where I'm at right now, we definitely have a process. And I'm sure, you know, all coach the same way. But for me, every Sunday is going to be basically the same. Every Monday is going to be this. Every Tuesday is going to be – we got a process. And the way that we run January through July, it's a process. And it might not be the most – as a coach, maybe some of these younger coaches, man, would like to have a little bit more flashy or this or that. That's fine. We can do some things, but we're not changing the process. And um, I've got some really good young coaches that have understood that, you know, I'm going to let them coach. I want them to coach. I want them to bring ideas. I want to change some things. But at the end of the day, we're not going to change the main focus of what we do and how we do things. Now, we might tweak it. We might add things. We might take some things away. We might add some little things here and there. But we're still going to stay with the same process that I learned from Willis White. I guess my first year starting, which would have been 1987, 80, 88. And, I mean, uh, it really hasn't changed. I no. mean, it's still barbells and weights, yep. and you can have bands and cones and all these machines, yep. but it's still bench, hand clean, squats. Well, I'll I tell mean, you what, man, it, when we were there, I will say this, and Willis, you know, I don't know, I just don't think you really knew much about it or whatever. We never did a hand clean or power clean one there, not one. We were squat, we were, uh, 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 we were bigger, stronger, faster for a while, and that, that, that deal. Um, but he did a lot of things on his own. We did a lot of like things now that I guess would, would be considered like some cross training stuff with the lunge stuff with this and that for injury prevention. We had a guy named, uh, coach Tucker, Tony Tucker, not Tony Tucker, uh, Matt Tucker was our uh, trainer. And he did a lot of things for injury prevention in the off season, you know, that wasn't really done back then. Um, but as soon as I got done and I got in college, you know, and uh, not only myself, but a couple other guys that played college football were talking to him too much about the power clean and the hand clean and explosive lifts. You know, he went and started going to clinics and he started incorporating that into his uh, lifting. Um, but, man, I mean, it, it, and another thing Willis taught me as a head coach, man, do it the best you can do it and make it the nicest you can make it. If these kids are going to bust their ass for you, do whatever you can to provide them the best things possible. And at Salem, we never wanted for anything. We had practice cleats. We had practice. We had game cleats. We had practice shimmels. We had game shimmels. We had the best jerseys. We had the best everything. Helmets, shoulder pads, you name it. Um, and, you know, 
not always everywhere do you go. You and I both been in the million. We had zero money. You know, we had zero things, but we both did whatever we could to take care of our kids and make it important to them. And I think that's what you try to do. You try to maximize your resources and you try to make it important to the kids. And I think that uh, it means something to the kids when they know that they're going to be taken care of when they put that time and commitment in. And that's one of the things I, I learned from Willis right away, man. You're going to work and you're going to be told to do, not told, but you're going to be, you're going to be asked you're going to be expected to put in a certain amount of time. You better be taken care of. And he did. He took care of us all the time. We, I had more Salem gear back in the day than I could ever imagine. And, you know, that's what we try to do here with our kids at Heritage. So if you have a question for Brad or anything, put it in the YouTube comments. Uh, I mean, Rich Rod, I really don't think gets the respect um, that he deserves as far as it goes for the spread offense. I mean, I know Urban Meyer, he, he gets the credit for, you know, going to Bowling Green and, you know, going to Utah and, you know, what they were doing at, at Louisville. I can't remember the coach's name, but he, he was, uh, you know, he's in the NFL now, I think his offensive coordinator. Um, but Coach Rodriguez and to just talk a little bit about, you know, when he was the head coach at Glenville, you know, what was his background? Where had he been? I think he'd been at WVU, right? As he played at WVU, I think GA at WVU. He coached at Salem, which is called at one time, I mean, Salem College there in uh, in West Virginia in that same conference. Well, uh, the Japanese took it over and then it became Salem Takeo, something like that, right? Well, he basically had a job one day. They came in the next day and told him they were canceling football. So, you know, and I don't know the exact timeline, but I know I think right after that, the next year, he got the job at Glenville State College. And, uh, you know, Rich Rod is a guy that he he made me who I am, him and um, his assistant coach, Dean Hood. Dean Hood was probably has most most inspirational coach I've ever coached or played for. Why? When I was a freshman, I was five and a half hours away from home. Only person from Virginia even on the team. Nobody I knew was up there. I'm at Glenville State College. Dude, there was a freaking McDonald's and a place called The Common Place to Eat. And and there wasn't shit to do. I mean, there wasn't, it, there wasn't no girls. There wasn't, it wasn't college, man. It was freaking football camp, 24-7, 365. And, you know, you get there. You come from being in a place like Salem. You get everything. You've got the facilities. You've got the gear. You've got the, uh, the, 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 the helmets. Everything is perfect. You go there, man, you got to fight for everything you've got. Shit, if we got a T-shirt, we're the happiest dudes on earth, you know? And, you know, you come in from being the guy, being a star in high school, now all of a sudden you're the low man on totem pole. I'm playing scout team, get my, you know, my, my shit kicked out of me. And, um, you know, but one day I just, I'm, I'm, I'm in there getting ready to take a shower. And uh, Dean, uh, Coach Hood was the defense coordinator then, and, and uh, it's probably, this is 1992, the fall of 92. And uh, says, hey, I want you to see me in your office after you shower up. I go in the office afterward, and uh, he said, hey, look, let's go eat. Let's go grab some lunch. And we went to Pizza Hut, only damn pizza, only place in the whole damn place to eat. And he talked to me. He said, he said you're thinking about quitting, aren't you? I said, no, I don't. I'm not coach. He said, yeah, you are. He said, you may not even know it, but that's what's on your face. That's what's on your attitude right now. That's how you carry yourself. He said, let me tell you something. You got two decisions here. You can be one or two people. You can be that guy that says he played college football. Or he could be that guy that says he quit. Mm. Now make that decision. He said, either one of them, you got to live with for the rest of your life. You know what? I decided right then and there, I'm not gonna be a, I'm not gonna be a bitch. <laughs> I'm gonna figure it out. And I, I busted my ass. I got a chance to return punts to end of that freshman year. I returned punts for the next three years after that. I played. Um, I rotated in the in the starting lineup as a sophomore, and I, I played wide receiver for four, for two years in a row. And I wasn't the greatest player in the world. I think my senior year I had 48 catches, and I was like fifth on the team because we threw the damn ball so much. Um, but I got to play college football. I got to play for a hell of a coach. Um, and going back to Rich Rod, man, Rich Rod was just that guy that, that had passion. No matter what he did, man, you couldn't outwork him. We got beat by West Virginia Wesleyan one year. And uh, I, we all did our laundry in the freaking field house, <laughs> whatever. And uh, so after the game, I come down to pick a load of laundry out of, out of the washers there. And he's still there, man. It's now we got games over at four o'clock. This is like nine o'clock at night. He's still there. 
he's on the board. He's just, you know, he's, he's working up stuff. He's doing this and that. I come in on Sunday morning, his ass is still there. I don't think he ever went home. And um, he's just that guy, man. He, he just showed, <clears throat> he showed me how to have passion for everything you do. Um, our off season workouts, he was passionate, you know, back, you know, back then we had no rules. They could be at everything, you know, this and that spring ball didn't matter. Passionate. And, uh, you know, a lot of people could say that Rich was a hard coach. He was hard on us. Man, he would do anything for us ever. If we needed something, no matter what it was, he would take care of it. Uh, we had an issue one year where our landlord tried to really dick us over. We'd already paid our rent up front, tried to get more money out of us. Rich went down there. We didn't have to ask him. He just kind of heard what was going on. Next day, we had everything taken care of. We wondered how it happened. He went down there and basically told him, this shit ain't going to do this shit to our players. You, we're gonna, you're going to take care of this. And they did. And we never had any issues after that. He didn't have to do that. You know, I mean, those are the kind of things he did. And uh, even to this day, man, you know, uh, I can text him. I can call him. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't take advantage of that. I mean, I don't abuse that. Right. Um, but uh, I know that if I need advice, I need a recommendation. If I need anything, he'd help us. And he doesn't get enough credit because, man, he started to spread offense. If he'd have been somewhere like a Florida State or Clemson or, uh, you know, Michigan or West Virginia where he ended up, he would have gotten all that credit. But, you know, a lot of what he did, Tommy Bowden got hired at Clemson, I mean, at Tulane, uh, right there around 96 or so, and uh, brought Rich Rod as an offense coordinator. And then he got uh, – uh, oh, what was, what was the guy at uh, Tulane, his quarterback? Sean guy. King. Sean King. There you go. Ended up playing for the Buccaneers. And when he got Sean King, everything was a wrap. Because then he got over there to Clemson and they got Woody Danzler. And then he got yeah. over to West Virginia, had Pat White, and that was the new thing. And now go look at offenses now and see who people are putting at their quarterback positions. That yeah, wasn't happening back then. I mean, yeah. I can remember I had a, a – I don't know, it was a tape or a DVD of Coach Rich Rod talking about his quarterback draw yeah. and his all hitch. Yep. Where if, if, if the draw ain't there, throw the hitch. Yep. You know what I mean, that is RPO. That is down the field RPO. I mean, well, what we all doing – at Glenville, that's still good today. I'm going to tell a story. Everybody's going to think it's a lie. And he tells this at every clinic. So if anybody's ever heard Rich Rod speak, they think he's lying, but he's not. We had a quarterback named Jed Drenning. Well, Jed Drenning is now like a sports caster, does some kind of social media something for WVU football. Jed could run from here to my door in about four days. Okay? Slowest white dude you've ever seen in your life. Could throw the rock, but couldn't move at all. Just couldn't move. And one game, we never he never ran the ball ever. If he had to run the ball, man, it was he was really running for his life. And one game, we're trying to hand off the ball, running backs on the other side, we're trying to hand off the ball, and all of a sudden the running back misses the handoff. The end crashes. Jed keeps it. He gets about 20 yards. Right then and there, started his own read. Man. And I'm telling you, from that time on, um, we kind of put it in our offense with some different quarterbacks after that. And that's the same concept he used with the Danzler, with Pat Whites, those kind of guys. And what year was that in? That was in probably 19 – that was probably 92 or 93. That was 92 wow. or 93, and that's a true story. And it was uh, his yeah. own read with the running back going across, read yep. the backside defensive yep. end like everybody yeah, no knows. pistol. We had nothing like that. It was just going to be a – you know, our run game was pretty simple back then. We were going to run some zone. And we were going to run, you know, some other thing because we weren't running the quarterback. There wasn't going to be no, but it just happened to where quarterback or the running back missed it in crash. Jed kept it for 15, 20 yards, you know, and there it's kind of started it. And uh, Jed was, uh, Jed Drenning was big actually on the implement, implementing kind of the spread because he was an older quarterback at the time. He'd been a couple of different places. I think he started out at, at uh, WVU as a walk on or something like that. So he was an older guy. He wasn't just your typical junior, senior quarterback. He probably had three years. I don't know how old he was. <coughs> Very smart guy, too. And they kind of bounced ideas off each other as a head coach quarterback. And we we evolved in what we had at Glenville. You know, uh, when I was there, even a little bit after I was there, and then what he evolved, he went a step further at Tulane, and then he went a step further at Clemson. Then he went a step further at, at WU, and then at Michigan. And, you know, it is where he is now. And, you know, uh, Rod Smith, which was with uh, which was was my quarterback that, that, that coached in all this place. Like I said, you know, he was with Rich at West Virginia, Clemson, uh, Arizona. Uh, shoot, I can't remember where else he was from, but you know, kind of the same philosophy. And uh, that, that, you know, I could walk into 
probably Jacksonville State right now and probably know most of what they're doing. And they could walk into my place and know what the hell I'm doing in terms of terminology and stuff like that. But you know and I know, man, football is a thief's sport. We steal everything from somebody. <laughs> and anybody says that they, they came up with this themselves is wrong. Uh, but I do think a lot of that original stuff and really nobody back then was shotgun all the time. And I don't know when he decided to do it, but when I came in in 92, we never got under center. I cannot remember going under center, but maybe a quarterback sneak when we needed to, or maybe a little a little formation we used on the goal line called thunder right, thunder left. I don't remember going under center at all. I mean, I if you now that we look back at it, I mean, the, the Bills, who were, you know, the best team pretty much in the AFC for four years, I don't remember them going under the center, nope. center very much. Nope. And, like, that whole deal with, like, Florida State and Charlie Ward and the shotgun, and that was their two-minute offense, and then with the K-gun. And, I mean, it, it was kind of – that was the beginning of it. Yep. You know? Yeah, I definitely think Rich Rod was right in there with, with his philosophy and, the, you know, the way he did things. And, you know, and Rich Rod, it, it, it was never complicated, you know, and, and – I'm sure he's more complicated now, but another thing that Rich taught me, man, you can have a complicated offense, but not be real complicated. Now in high school, we might be complicated. Um, but I think that we keep it as simple as humanly possible. And still today, I know how he calls plays. You know, I've listened to, to Gruden and some of those guys call plays. And I'm like, damn, I don't know how I can remember one play, you know, basically an offense, but Rich always did a really good job of uh, keeping it simple. And we were able to pick it up quick and, and did a good job coaching it. I was lucky. I started learning on my, my freshman year. He had me learn all four wide, wide receiver positions. And my head was spinning throughout most of my freshman year. But all of a sudden, I got it. And when I got it, by learning the, all the slots in the outside, when I got it, I got it. I had the whole offense. And as a coach now, I'm glad that that happened for me too. Um, but, man, it, it, and it, the thing with Rich, he treated you. He treated you the same – if you worked hard and you and you bought in and you did what you're supposed to do, he didn't treat you no different than the star player. Chris George was my was my college roommate for a couple of years. Chris George was a guy that had broke Jerry Rice's record for most catches in a season, most catches in a career at one time. And shit, he treated me the same way he treated Chris George. I mean, it's just you know, it, it, he he was a good guy, man, and he had our backs. We knew it. There were days we'd go home and we'd cuss the hell out of him because he'd be hard on us. But you know what? At the end of the day, I, I'm thankful. Because you know what, I can get my butt chewed now. If I had to get my butt chewed by my principal or AD or somebody like that, I'm not gonna feel sorry for myself. I'm not gonna pout and cry. I'm gonna. I understand. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, yes, sir. No, sir. I made a mistake. I own it. I account for it. Move on. And I think that's something our kids today have a problem with. They don't like to be corrected. Um, and he, he taught me that early. He taught me it's not about me. It wasn't about us. It was about the team. And it's not ever personal. If, if he got on our ass, it was to make us a better football player and a better man. And, you know, it might have taken me a while to figure that out, but I definitely figured that out. And I definitely think he's been a huge part of the way I've came out in my life. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I mean he, he's got to be – I mean, he, he will be a college football Hall of Fame coach. Yeah. I, you know, I, I would I say think so. – I think so. And, and he wasn't always popular because he did get – he did jump kids' ass on the sidelines. And, you know, he – he, he didn't really care what he thought. You go listen to him speak. He don't have all this, all these computers. He don't have a GA. He's still got a freaking overhead. He's still got an overhead. He puts something on the overhead and, and does that. But I'm telling you right now, man, the man knows football. Um, he's loyal. Um, Calvin McGee was just passed away, was his offensive coordinator at Jacksonville State, passed away before this past football season started. And he had, he had, had Calvin McGee with him at every stop uh, up until then. All, all the stops. I can't remember when he started. I think it was West Virginia. Um, but he's 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 a little guy. Um, he, he's he's just a football coach, man. And uh, he, you know, he had a huge impact on me, and I think he had a huge impact on a lot of the guys' lives. Yeah, it'd be cool if we could get him on here, me and you. You know. Yeah, that'd be awesome. That'd yeah, be awesome. That would be big, man. He's got his own little podcast I listen to every once in a while, The Hard Edge. Uh, kind of started that a couple years ago, and that that's kind of interesting. I don't know if you've ever listened to it before. Is it Rich called, Rod's podcast? It's Rich Rod's podcast. It's him and his I didn't daughter. I know he had one. I'm going to listen to it, though. It's him and his daughter, man, and they do it, and um, it's, it's it's pretty good. I listen to it a lot. Um, shoot, I guess back right before COVID, right after COVID. Uh, I think it was right after COVID, and then he had it when he went to Louisiana Monroe or whatever he went to, 
And then I think he started right after he left Ole Miss. And uh, he's got it right now. I haven't listened to it a lot lately because I haven't had the time. But uh, it's pretty funny. It's pretty good. Uh, he's, he, he's still got a guy on staff there that was with us named Dusty Rutledge. And Dusty's been his equipment guy slash whatever for the whole time. And, you know, they talk about old, they talk about the old Glenville days. And I'll tell you what, man, we had nothing in Glenville. Nothing. We didn't get I mean, it was last chance you from what I it remember. It was last chance you one thousand last shows. chance you. I mean it was Except really last chance you had a hell of a lot better equipment and a hell of a yes. lot better field to play on than we did. <laughs> Where were all those players from? Man, we had them from everywhere. At one point in time, and I'm gonna probably be wrong on this, high or low, but we had kids from around 39 different states. <laughs> uh, we had California, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, um, uh, Canada. Um, <clears throat> we had Arizona, shit, man, obviously West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, you know, all that kind of stuff. Ohio, a bunch of kids from Ohio, uh, a bunch of kids from, uh, uh, we had a couple of kids from Indiana. I mean, we had them everywhere, uh, Troy, everywhere. Um, we had a big left tackle, which was one of my best friends named big John Jackson. John Jackson was from California. Another big defensive lineman that came in with him, uh, was from, um, uh, Canada. Uh, we so got, how did they do it? We got, How, they do it? we got a lot of junior college kids. Okay, uh, so ju junior college, did they do on-campus visits or did they sign them and then bring them there? You know, that's a magic $100,000 question. Uh, I think if some of those guys ever would have saw a campus, they never would have came. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of them, I think, you know, it was one of those situations they had nowhere else to go. You know, yeah. either something happened. The last stop before them. the bus stop. Man, we had guys come from Ohio State. Some come, from, some come from Florida State, some bigger schools here and there, maybe some smaller Division One schools, other Division Two schools. Somehow they just ended up at Global State, and uh, they bought in. And I think, oh, man, it was my junior year. We went to the national championship in 1993, my sophomore wow. year, in NAI. We were in NAI. And uh, the next year in 1994 – we were going NCAA first year. We were dual affiliated. And I think all but one starter on defense was a junior college guy. So we had the transfer portal before the transfer portal was big. No I doubt. Was, I was one of the last – me and a couple other kids were some of the last actual high school kids they recruited. So, I mean, people are – like I hear high school coaches saying now, you know, this is really terrible for high school kids, you know. You know, these colleges, they're not recruiting high school kids anymore. But, I mean, when you played college ball, they weren't recruiting high school kids. They were recruiting junior college guys, older guys that could come in and play right away. Is there a difference today compared to that? Or was he just ahead of the game? Well, I think he was ahead of the game. And I, I, I want to take that back. We did recruit high school kids. But when I came in, my, my freshman group when I came in, we probably brought about – 17 to 20 kids in, right? To about eight to 10 kids, right? Yeah, so a, few, a, lot those kids, a lot of those kids weren't money kids. You know, yeah. just money just, you know, you only have so much money yeah, and you, you had to earn your cut money. it up. Yep, you had to earn your money. And, um, you know, I, I think it was ahead of the curve. I think, you know, I think it was different because, you know, it was kind of the last chance and there wasn't a lot of, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of like, hey, I'm transferring just because I'm not getting to play. Or I'm transferring because the coach yelled at me. Yeah. Or I'm transferring because I want to play the inside wide receiver, not the outside wide receiver. You know, <laughs> it's crazy. And now with the NIL deals, you know, people transfer because they're going to get more money. You know, it's just – they've opened up Pandora's box, in my opinion, in, in college football. Good, bad, indifference. It's never going to change. I mean – I mean, is, it ever, is there yeah. any way to come back? I, I don't think so. I think that's what I was trying to say. I don't think you're ever going to see it go back to what it was. I just don't think you can. You can't sit there and pay these guys all this money for these NILs or whatever they're called, and then all of a sudden take it back from them. I really yeah. don't. I don't think you can. And I, I think the unfortunate thing about it is these dudes coming out of high school are getting all this money, and they hadn't proved themselves yet. They hadn't played a play. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I college coaches make a lot more money. They got a lot bigger houses. They do all those kind of things. But, man, I tell you what, I don't know if I'd want those headaches right now. I, I, I don't. And we as high school coaches, we got enough headaches. We still have to recruit our own players in our own school. We still have to keep our own kids happy in our own program. Um, we still have to figure out how to win with less. Um, we still got to figure out how to provide resources with less. You know, we have to do all those things. We have to be the – sometimes be the dad, the father figure, the head football coach. Um 
the team mom, and everything at one time. But, you know, at the end of the day, we all do it because football is the greatest sport in the world. And, 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 and I think the unfortunate thing about it with the way things are going now, kids are going to lose sight of what they're, what's, what's real and, and what the real thing is. And the real thing is the game. The game, man, they get a chance to play the game at the high. What would you to give them to play the, the, the chance to play at some of these Division One schools just for one game? And these dudes are just, you know, they're they're they're, they're greedy. They're this. They're that. You know, whatever. Hey, I want to sign them. Take this hat and take that hat and <clears throat> do all those things, man. I just I would have given anything just to play one day <laughs> for those kind of things. But you know, teach its own. I still think college football is the best thing going. I'd rather sit down and watch college football any day of the week rather than NFL. I love college football. I think people are still going to pay attention to college football. Um, I just think eventually what's happening is you're going to have the have and the have nots. And, you know, unfortunately. What, what's changed other than maybe a 12 team tournament? True. And I mean, true, TCU true. playing for the national championship. I mean, who true. would have thought of that? Yeah. And, and true. And I, and I feel like what will happen eventually you'll have your, 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 your power five or whatever it's going to be, your power 25, power 40, whatever, whichever ones can compete money-wise, and then you're going to have the rest. And then yeah, you're going to have the, Let me ask you that. something about that. Like March Madness basketball, you know, you got the one-and-done teams, and then you got the Gonzagas. You got the teams that they keep their guys there four years, and then they make a run in the tournament. Do you think that we'll see that in college football where – you know, a team can keep guys there for four years and they go and beat an Alabama that only has one year guys. I mean, do you I think it's possible? Think I guess anything's possible. The 12 team t- playoff. I guess it is. I guess it is. I just don't think you're going to ever see four year players hardly again, especially up high, up high. You know what I mean? I, I think now it's going to be the coaches that can go recruit out of that transfer portal, put together what they have, mold them in the spring. Like we're talking about that January, February put them together and then coach them and then figure out a way to buy, get them to all buy in and win. And that's hard. And the ones that are going to be able to take advantage of it, do it the right way and, and uh, figure it out are going to, are going to stay ahead of the game because we all understand the game changes, you know, it, it changes, but it stays the same. But uh, you know, right now it's, it used to be take players and develop them and, you know, keep them for four years and you maybe get a fifth year out of them. Now there's, <laughs> that's not going to be the case. I just don't see kids stay anywhere four or five years anymore. Um, if they if they blow up in a smaller school, they they're gonna go and be bigger. If yeah. they blow up in a bigger school, then they just want to be better and maybe go somewhere else. Maybe this team has a chance to win a national championship. You know the whole um, LeBron James thing. You know mm-hmm. the so super can, teams. Right, so I can win a national championship or a, uh, an NBA championship or whatever. And I just I, I think the days of the four or five year players are are out the window. I, I just think it is. I would hope that the NCAA would come back, make the the, the, the portal window a smaller and um, maybe a shorter time. And maybe even where, you know, uh, the NIL money, maybe you got to be at the institution for a year before you receive it or something. I don't know. You know, I just think there's some things that they could put it back, you know, a little bit in order. We went from I mean, Could the NIL deals, I guess they're done by boosters or, or yeah. private businesses. Okay, can yeah. they be multi year? You know, because I mean, I, who wants to do, sign a one-year deal than have to? I mean, at least it'd be like the NFL, three years. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I just think that we went from all kinds of rules, <laughs> you know, every rule in the world, to really we just opened Pandora's box. Yeah. Whether that's good, bad, and difference, I don't know. Time will tell. It's you know, I'm still kind of an older school guy. Don't get me wrong. I think the kids deserve something because all the money these schools are making on them. Um, but I think there's got to be a, there's got to be a mid, middle ground, and I, unfortunately now it's just basically like a free agency. Whoever yeah. can get the best deal and every get year, deal, it, it's it's same thing. So if I just got here to this school and you know this school's got something better, who knows? And I know there are certain rules about how many times you can transfer and this and that. It, I mean, it is what it is. And I also think you got to look at it differently with grad transfers. They might have already been there for four years, and they graduate and they go for one year. You know, I, I don't know. Like JT Daniels. I mean, he's been – this is his fourth school, I think. Yeah. Well, exactly. And, and that, that shouldn't be able to happen. Um, we have a kid that, that played at Liberty for four years, Chris Magnuson, and a uh, really good player at Liberty, started corner, and he took his grad transfer year and went to SMU. But I think he I think he always thought, for good reason, that he could play bigger. And now he's got his chance to do that. And he hit the portal. He got recruited by Cincinnati, got recruited by a bunch of bigger teams. You know, end up going to J to SMU. He's going to get a chance to prove that. 
And I think that's what it's all about. I mean, I like yeah. that part of it. I like that part of it. But, you know, with the good comes the bad and so on and so forth. So, like I said, time will tell. Right now I'm not a big fan of it, but who am I in the college football world? I'm a nobody. So. I just did like a, a, a YouTube live or whatever it is, Twitter live before you came on. And I was talking about uh, Mr. Beast, you know, the YouTube guy. He says that the seek, the, the cheat code to life is to surround yourself with people that you want to be like. So the cheat code to life is to surround yourself with people you want to be like. So when you became a head coach in Virginia, who were some of those GOAT coaches that took you? I know your dad's a coach. Your grandpa was a coach. Willis White was your coach. But were there any other coaches in the state of Virginia that took you under their wing? Well, this guy didn't really take me under a wing. He might not even know how much influence he had on me, but Taylor Edwards at Martinsville. Um, you know, he coached the guys like Nikki Fisher, Sean Moore, those kind of guys. And I just, you know, I, I was a ball boy for Salem when they played against Martinsville back in the day. And Taylor, later on, Taylor asked me to come teach him some of our spread offense and so on and so forth. But, man, there's so many guys out there that I would consider just great football coaches. I've had a, a, a pleasure or, excuse me, a privilege to coach against. Steve Ragsdale at Glad, I mean, at um, Giles, man, he, he single wing is Steve Ragsdale. I mean, that's what he does. That's who he is. That's when you name, you know, those single wing guys. My defense coordinator is a single wing guru. I mean, he loves the single wing. They're, they're, they got a secret society, man. Fear oh, of yeah. Fear Balanced of or unbalanced. They're crazy. Yeah, they're all crazy. They, yeah, they go to a little secret clinics. You gotta, they they huddle cool. up the corner, and if you're a spread guy, they look at you like you're crazy. You know, now he's defense coordinator for me. He, 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 uh, he's a big – he's a spread fan. We're doing well. But, uh, um, you know, just so many guys, man. Ragsdale. Who is the best? Who are the best? Bo Who are the Hinch best coaches Hinch that you've ever coached against? Oh, man. Again, I coach against Willis White. Coach against uh, – I never got to coach against Bo Henson. He, he was legendary over here at class. But um, – uh, Steve Ragsdale, definitely. Tom Turner, definitely. Um, you know, Bob Christmas, man. I mean, I'm not trying to, to, to blow him up or anything, but at the end of the day, you know, Bob Christmas won here state championship with Anthony's point and those guys went to Georgia North Hall, won a lot of games and, you know, became part of the Seminole district over here was very successful at Jefferson Forest and kind of took the Amherst program back. I always kind of looked at him. He was coaching when I was playing, you know, I, I've just had a chance to, to be in the, the same room, coach against on the field, and a lot of times beat the guys that I looked up to growing up. And uh, now what's going on now is I'm transferring to that uh, young guy, you know, that, that that would upset people to now I'm the guy that everybody wants to beat their ass. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, the old guy, the old guy. But, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I just – as long as I still have the the excitement level, the passion for this game – and to see see kids push past their limits, and that's something you know. Today in the weight room, we got a young team coming up next year, but today was an awesome day because we got the chance to see these kids pass push past their limits and what they can and cannot do, and what they think they can and cannot do. Kids are capable of so much; they just got to believe that they're capable of so much. And you know that's what keeps me going. And you know I've got a great staff. You're talking about guys in Virginia, but you surround yourself with guys you want to be like. I've got an assistant coach that's been on my staff for 22 years. Now talk a little bit about coach. John Eric's been with me for 22 years, and uh, he is my ride or die. And what I mean by that is, man, he's been loyal to me. He's been in every place I've been, um, everywhere we've gone. He's my old line coach slash offense coordinator. We kind of called the games together along with now we got a third guy named Jared Martin. Uh, but coach, coach is uh, coach is just a he's a salty, fat, miserable, mean a-hole, but loves football, loves kids, and just a typical O-line coach, man. And, you know, in this world, you, you're talking about being a head coach earlier for some advice. Hire those guys. Hire that one guy you know has got your back no matter what. No matter if you make the stupidest call in the world, he's going to have your back. And no matter what happens, he's got your back. And that's who Coach Eric is. He's that guy that's had my back for 22 years. And How did you meet him? Uh, Rod Smith, uh, which is now Jacksonville State's offense coordinator, he was at Urbana College. And uh, Coach Eric, which is older than me, Coach Eric's 62, 61, 62 years old. He started late in his career. He was working factory work in Ohio before that. 
and he was in Athens, Ohio, actually where Joe Burrow's from. And, uh, he, uh, he was working factory work and then got on, went, went to master's, get his master's degree at uh, Urbana, started GA with, with uh, uh, Rod Smith and started GA on the offensive line. And I needed no line guy. And I called Rod Smith. Hey, man, you got anybody? I said, yeah, I do, actually. So Coach Eric drove down about eight to ten hours, uh, came to interview with William Campbell, and I hired him. And the first two months he had nowhere to live, lived with me until he got his first paycheck. And uh, his damn car broke down probably three weeks after he got there and, Got a chance. To buy, sorry about that. Got a chance to buy his first uh, car, and uh, he's been with me ever since. They did a good job. They were quiet for an hour and nineteen minutes. That's pretty good for them. They must want to go outside. Yeah, they're just barking to bark. I got three of them over there. So you've been a lot of different places, and you've co- coached with some great coaches. You know, in the history of Virginia and in you know college football, Coach Rich Rod and the guys that were on his staff. I mean, what is it that – I mean, I guess it's a good administration, but is there any more into having a great football program other than the administration in the places that you've been? Well, I think you got to have – I think you got to have a good community too. And it doesn't necessarily mean you – know, there's a lot of kinds of people that will put city schools down. You don't have a lot of attendance at your games. You don't have this, you don't have that. You know what, man? we got a pretty good fan base. Uh, we play in a big stadium. We play at City Stadium, which is – you know, sits almost uh, 9,000 people. And, you know, us in glass, they, they want to talk about us all the time because we don't have a lot of people. I'm going to tell you right now, we take our crowds, we put them in a regular average high school football stadium that sits 3,000 people. We got a, we got a pretty much a full house all the time. Um, but we don't. We play in a big stadium. And I think we got a good crowd. But I think a community, man. I think a community that, A, gets behind them financially, gets behind them just in coming to the games, um, that gets behind just what you're doing. You know, I one of the I've been in this community for a long time. Even when I was at William Campbell, I kind of lived over here in Lynchburg, and uh, it's it's a great community. And you know, you, you get to know people. You get they get to know who you are. You start you start knowing uh, kids of kids you coached. You know, what mm-hmm. I mean those kind of things. And uh, but I think you need a community. I think you need a community. I think you need administration. And um, I, I, I think you need you need a staff, man. You need a staff that's that's going to have your back and that, that can coach and that, that will believe in what you're doing. And I see so many of these coaches these days, man, that got these young guys on staff or even older guys that don't have their head coaches back. You know, at the first sign of some type of adversity, they're pointing them out on social media. They're doing this or they're mm. doing that. And, and all that does is it just causes it, – it causes backlash within your team, and that's something you don't need. If, if you're going to deal with that, you need to deal with that from the outside, not the inside. And I think, you know, with me, everybody I hire, they need to be able to fit my philosophy. And that doesn't mean they got to do exactly what I want to do. That does not mean that. That does not mean that they got to be a yes man. I think guys on my staff will tell you I'm going to let them coach. Uh, but at the same time, I got to know that they're going to have my back. I'm going to know that they're, I'm going to be able to get in a foxhole with them and 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 they got my back. And, um, you know, I, I've been very fortunate here. I've hired every one of my coaches since I've been here. And um, I've got together a really good staff. I've got one opening right now I'm trying to fill. And, it's not something I just want to feel right away. I want to feel, you know, last year I went uh, uh, for a while and didn't feel it. So the guy kind of fell in my lap and he fit our profile and he's been a great coach for us. Um, so I'm not so quick. I went I went for two years with one short just because I couldn't find one that I felt like was, uh, you know, worthy. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but I think all those things, any coach that thinks they can do it by themselves is crazy. you got to have a support staff. And uh, that means your staff and everybody. And I'll tell you another thing, man. You probably know this as well as I do. You got to have a good trainer. Trainer's got to be on your team. Trainer, oh yeah, lucky. We've been lucky since I've been here. We've had three, and all three of them have been on on board. Because if you get in those situations where you got trainers that are not for you, but it may be against you, or don't have oh, the same yeah. philosophy, you're never going to get a, a team tough because they're not going to follow that same kind of deal. So. You know, I think that that's one of the biggest things, too, that I think that your trainer, your administration, uh, your staff, and your community. You can sit here and I can list a million things that, that, that can make or break a football coach, but I think those are your top four, in my opinion. So you talked a little bit about social media. And they're, they're I call them Twitter coaches or <laughs> social media coaches. And, you know, in the off season, you see a lot. Uh, of action from these guys. Um, they win the off season. I mean, do you think that the younger coaches understand that this is a fraternity 
and that no, I do you not. Know, we're sometimes you're going to beat me. Sometimes I'm going to beat you. But in the end, it all works out. My dad always told me my dad wasn't a coach, uh, but he said, Troy, some you're going to lose some games you should have won, and you're going to win some you should have lost. So, like, what can you say to the guys that are out there on social media, the trainers, the guys that are um, the chicken hawks, the, uh, you know, the street agents, the, the coaches that, you know, have beef with other coaches. And I know I've had issues with guys in the past, but it works out in the end. But, you know, how do you feel about that? I mean, well, I just feel like I just feel like that, you know, like you said, it's a fraternity, number one. Number two. I just never felt that you got to put your business on social media. I just, you know, it, it's one of those situations that um, I'm going to cut my watch and everything else off. One of those situations that uh, w- you follow me on Twitter and I put a lot of stuff out on Twitter, but it's all football related. It has nothing to do with me. There's not, I might put a picture of my dogs up there every once in a while, dog's birthday, uh, with a kid, happy birthday, former player, whatever, this or that. You know, I'll like a stupid tweet here and there. But at the end of the day, it's about our football program. I'm not going to get on there and give my opinion on something. I'm not going to get on there and say something bad about somebody else. I'm not going to get on there and try to make somebody look bad. That's not what it's all about. We we, we try to go through, uh, and we didn't, we didn't get a chance to do it two years ago, uh, but we did it last year. We try to go through what we call social media class with our kids, what you should have on social media, what you shouldn't have on social media. We have the resource officer come in at that time. We have a guidance counselor come in at that time. We have a principal come in at that time. We talk about the, the, the importance of having the right social media. We talk about recruiting. Recruiters get on there. They, they, they like you. They, they, they've seen you play. They've heard good things from your head coach. And all of a sudden, they get on your social media, and you've got all this nasty stuff on there. Or you got this, this rhetoric that has nothing to do with football or, or you as a person, and it's just, it's just not the right stuff. And maybe it's gang-related. Maybe it's um, – you know, uh, maybe it's just pornography. Maybe it's just some stupid, obscene jokes. Maybe it's just whatever it might be. It's something that's going to turn them off. And then it's easy just to scroll to the next. Because these kids don't understand, man, there's high, there's college football players out there everywhere. There's the whole nation. So if you don't check a box, they're just going to scroll right past you. And, um, you know, I, I think that we got to, as adults, understand that at the same time, man, don't you don't want to put your program, yourself, your staff, or anything else in jeopardy because of something you have to say. You feel like you have to say on social media. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, I see a bunch of coaches these days that, you know, just want to talk about this or talk about that, or, you know, something doesn't go well for them. And then all of a sudden they're throwing this coach under the bus or that coach under the bus. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's their own coach. And you don't need to talk about everything. You know, when social media first came out, and I'm an old school guy. I get that. I'm older. That's fine. All right. But, when, when it first came out, all these people want to take pictures of what they make. They, like, I, hey, I made eggs today. Here's a picture of my eggs. It's on <laughs> media. Hey, I made a freaking sandwich day. It's on social media. Um, you know, I, I, I took a shit today. It's on social media. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, what do you need to do that for? You know, and I think it's the same thing. Hey, we did this. But now, don't get me wrong. I think it could be a great tool to promote your program. We all do it. Hey, we had a great day in the weight room today. I take a picture of my guys lifting. Unbelievable. They get excited about it, whatever. That's 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 usually positively my thing. <clears throat> but if I'm putting on there and I mention a coach by, by name or a program by name or, you know, I I just don't think there's a way. I don't think there's uh, I don't think there's a place for it. And yeah. I do think younger coaches and and uh, don't have the, the, the sense of fraternity. And But if you go back and you look, there haven't been a whole lot of in-person football clinics since 2019. And 20, 21, and now 22. Yeah, we, we did ours last year, but, yep. you know, I, I had to rent a hotel. Yep. And, 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 and you, you look know, at, like, to, the Nike Coach Deer Clinic now has cut down their their sites. And, you know, a lot of these play- – so we don't have the coach – we haven't had the Virginia High School League Clinic forever. When's the last time we had that? 2013, 14? So a lot of these coaches have never really been a part of something like that. They've never gone and spent the night – with their staff and spent the night got in the, in the hotel room with other coaches and talk ball and, you know, start to learn. Yeah. I might want to beat that dude's ass every freaking Friday night we play him. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, man, I'm sitting here and I'm talking, it's July or excuse me, it's January. I'm not playing any games anytime soon. Let me learn something from this guy. Yeah. We're competitors. I mean, we're all competitors. We all want to win, but then again, I mean, 
you might need that guy to help you get a job or hire you if you get let go. And I mean, you, you've always been successful everywhere you've been, but I mean, you're going to need some help. Here's what I know. One of my best coaches I've ever hired, you know, was a guy that, that, that unfortunately, you know, uh, wasn't a head coach anymore and, and and left there and didn't have a lot of people offering jobs. Yeah. Um, he ended up being my defensive coordinator, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. And uh, we won a lot of football games. Went to two state championships, won a state championship, and he was a big part of that. And that's because I had his back, and I know that he would have my back in the same situation. And that's what coaches do. You don't try to tear people down. You try to bring them up. Same thing we try to coach up, you know, regular deal. What's going on, Josh? Yeah, Josh's uh, son is an eighth grader, I believe. And he played for Benedictine. I don't know if he's going to go to Cosby High School, but I actually was his quarterback coach when he was a okay. little bitty guy. I was coaching at Union. I know he's a Salem guy. So cool. did you and Josh yep. play together? What year did you graduate, Josh? So I graduated in 92. I can't remember. And J Josh went to Virginia Tech, didn't he? I believe I think he did. so, yeah. Well, so. he'll answer. I'll put it back up there. No worries, no worries. But, um, no, I mean, you know, I just – I think social media has got its place, you know. Um, yeah, I, we used to every, – every year before COVID, we'd go down to, to uh, Oscar Schmidt. And, you know, we, we would go do a little pre-practice, like a practice with them. We'd do seven-on-seven seven slash lineman. They'd feed us. We'd have – we'd have we'd, – we'd break bread together with Coach Scott and those guys. And then we'd go to the beach. And we would uh, – that 94, I was in 92. I remember seeing that, y'all going to the beach. Yeah, and um, you know, that was those are things you want to put on social media. You know, you want to put your bank on social media. You want to put, you know, uh, other, no question. I, I I'm I'm getting to be older than everybody, dude. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, you you do things like that, and um, to me, that's what social media is for. Um, I, I'm not a big social media guy. I have an Instagram page. I don't post anything really about football. It's all my dogs. It's all I really post on my Instagram page. Tom Hall. From Manchester and I are real good friends because he's got dogs. And uh, I'll tell you an embarrassing story about me. I'm going to throw him under the bus at the same time. I've got a little girl dog. Uh, I got all American bullies like him. And uh, he put he posted a picture on Instagram with his dog with a pair of pajamas. And uh, I, I texted him and called him up right away and asked him, where'd you get those pajamas from? Because I had to buy her a pair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those are things that, that you know, as coaches – Tom and I, we talk football a lot, but we don't. We talk about a lot of things that have nothing to do with football through social media, and mm -hmm. I think that's important too. I think you know, there's a time you got to basically, you know, understand that yeah, you want to beat those guys you're coaching against them. But at the end of the day, man, they're they're your they're your uh, they're your uh, competitors, but they're also your your comrades. They're also your you know guys that you can learn a lot of things for and you can lean on. Yeah, I got. I want to ask you something about. You know, when you were a younger coach about your record and what, you know, how the team did. And then I want to ask you something about who were the best college recruiters uh, that you, you talking about record. You mean our record? Yeah, like, uh, like when I was a young coach, I was always so worried about my record. You know, yeah. we're five, five, five. We got to win this many so I don't have a losing record. Yeah. And ha have – have you ever gone through that where you're so worried about the end and not the process? And well, then, like, I always wonder how these guys do it for so long. Yeah. And well, I, I, the biggest thing is how they do it for so long at one place. Uh, you know, Willis White was at Salem for 20-some years. I can't remember what it was. But he told me right before he left, he told me that, you know, one of his – not going to say regrets because you know, I don't think he regretted ever being at Salem. But he said one of the things he might have done differently – was changed jobs after about 10 or 12 years. Felt like he might've been there too long at one point. And, you know, I've been now here at Heritage for 11. I think naturally as a head football coach, you're egotistical. I mean, that's us. I mean, we want to win. We, we, we feel like we, we, we should win. You know, we do the things and you set your bar up here. My bar is up here. And I think where we've been right now with our program, what's hard for me is, you could go seven and four with a young team and it could feel like a, a, a failure because of what you've done in the past as a team and a program. But at the end of the day, in reality, you took a seven, you took a group that might've only been four and six and you went seven and four, right? That's great. Um, versus let's say you take over a new job and you take over a losing program. All of a sudden you go seven and four greatest season ever, right? You feel good about yeah. yourself. 
And I think that that's, that's why some people make those jumps. You know, I jumped around a lot early, um, but at the same time, I think there's a huge challenge and a huge, um, there's a huge challenge in trying to figure out how to do it the next day and how to do it the next year and how to do it with the next team and the next group. And we're starting to get those eighth graders come in now and I start to see those kids. I'm like, you know, I think we can figure it out. Uh, but you know, and I know, man, it ain't no fun playing the same teams every year because they know you and you know them. And, and the Seminole District is such a competitive district. Um, I respect every one of them in this district, but I hate pulling them in the playoffs, man. If I got to play LCA for the second time or <coughs> Brookville for the second time or something like that. And um, it's hard. Um, but records don't define teams. You know, and I know that. Um, teams define teams, how, what they overcome during that year to find teams. Um, you know, I will say this though, some of my best teams record wise have been some, uh, surprising teams. I never thought they would be what they were in 2005. We won a state championship at William Campbell, never should have won it. Kids just were overachievers and, and, and decided they were going to win it in 2018. We won the state championship here at heritage. Would never told you we'd have won a state championship. Never. Uh, this past year, we got a chance to go to the state championship. We got beat by Phoebus. Again, if I'm a betting man, I bet against it. Um, but all three of those teams, overachievers, um, and all three of those teams bought in, and all three of them were very physically tough. All three believed in the process, and all three loved preparing. And I think if you find a team that likes to prepare, whether it's practice, film, whatever, it's a fun team to coach. Um, but definitely I think it's easy to get caught up on records, man. I, I, unfortunately, and, and, and here's, here's another sad part. Unfortunately, in this world, you don't win enough often. You'd probably be looking for jobs somewhere else. You know what I mean? And and, and that's part of our that's part of our job too. You know, and, uh, uh, some of our uh, friends, uh, their job performance doesn't get put on the front page of the paper every Saturday morning. <laughs> Everybody's gonna know how we did in our job. You know, they read the paper on Saturday morning during August, September, October, November, hopefully December. They, they're gonna know exactly how we did in our job. You can just look at me, man. If I'm huge, that means I'm yeah. I'm not very good. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. If I get skinny, same then then we're, yeah. we're pretty good. Yeah, same thing. And uh, but you know, I, I think that winning's important. People that say it's not is crazy. You know, we want to win games. Uh, I think we want to win games. More importantly, I think you know, I was so proud of the 2002 team, 2005 team, we encountered my first two state championship teams, and just any team after that, because it proved to them it can be done. It proved them hard work, dedication, commitment does pay off. You 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 do what you're supposed to do. It's going to succeed. And that, again, goes back to you can do that in life. Yeah. What was your second question? You said something about the I was, I was just going to ask you, we're Virginia guys. You know, your dad was a, a high school coach in Virginia. Your grandpa was a high school coach in Virginia. And I, I'm a homer. I, I think the guys should stay and play in Virginia if they have offers from Virginia schools. So who – are some of the best college coaches that you've had an opportunity for them to recruit your players and what was so good about those guys? Unfortunately, I'm not going to be a great answer to this question. I haven't had a bunch of division one kids. I truly in my 25 years coaching in the state of Virginia or 23 as a head coach of the state of Virginia, two in West Virginia, I've only had one, what I call power five kid. And that was Cedric Pyramid at UVA. Um, now I've had a number of kids go to Liberty. Um, I've had a number of kids, ODU, JMU, things like that. But I haven't had a whole lot of, you know, big time dudes. You know what I'm saying? I don't get that. I never had that kid that sat on the podium and we to have 17 hats on there and figure out which one it was. But I think in, in the state of Virginia, since I've been here, man, uh, Brian Steinspring was one of the better recruiters I've ever been around. I thought he did a great job. I thought the whole Virginia Tech staff when Beamer was there, did everything in their power to keep the local kids. Why is that? Why, 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 why were they so good? I think because they tried to keep the local kids in state. I think that they made it a priority to, to did get they local do that kids. by reaching the high school coaches. I mean, I think so I think so. And I think by not only that, I think by just, you know, making it a priority, they made it known that they want to keep the, the local kids. They made it known when they got a Tyrod Taylor or a Michael Vick down in Virginia beach, that they wanted them there at Virginia tech. And, and they, not only did they want them, they were going to do everything, you know, they could to get them. And um, I think that, um, you know, in, in some cases, you know, maybe some other staffs in the state of Virginia, maybe not always done that. You know what I mean? Um, I, I think it's a, I, I think it's very important in Virginia that you try to keep Virginia kids in Virginia, obviously. 
you know, we want to do everything we can. But I also think that that's becoming harder and harder to do because of social media, because of the NILs, because of those kind of things. Kids are not, it's not just a, a box. It's not just a, a round box anymore. It's not like a, a, a circle, 50 mile circle, 100 mile circle, 150 mile circle. These kids can go nationwide. And I think that's one of the, the biggest thing now that affects it. But I thought Beamer staff, man, all together, Bud Foster, Stein Spring, Kurt Newsom, Coach Calf. Yeah, Coach Calf. I mean, Coach Cavanaugh, all those guys, man, were unbelievable. I mean, I, I just thought they were great. So um, was it because as a high school coach, I mean, you, you you've seen the guys, man. You you might not have had many guys that signed to go to a FBS school or whatever it's called now, the power five schools. But I mean, they come through your door. Yeah, and they do. like you said, if you don't have a player, they might not come. But well, I'll tell you what, man. I mean, you know, there's schools, um, you know, like Virginia, Virginia Tech, they're gonna come through no matter what. Um, but I'm gonna tell you right now, man, we're probably one of the better recruiters and better staffs, and and, and to me in the state of Virginia, just Hugh Freeze's staff. I, I had those guys right here next to me as a resource for the longest time, and uh not only were they very account uh, accommodating to us, uh, they they went after they went after local kids, man. They went after Virginia kids pretty good, and people probably don't give this guy enough enough uh, credit for rebuilding the Liberty uh, program. But Danny Rocco, Danny Rocco built the Liberty program with, on, on the backs of Virginia kids back when they were bad. I remember going to uh, watch Liberty uh, uh, play a spring game round when I first came here in 2002, 2003, around that time. I think Ken Karcher was the head coach then, and they only didn't have enough to – they had enough to do 7-on-7 seven on, seven on one end and half line on the other end. Mm. And Danny got in here and, you know, kind of turned that thing around. And I, I think that he was a – I think he was a big recruiter and, and did a really good job when he went to Delaware and did a really good job when he – you know, it was at Richmond before that in the state of Virginia. Um, I mean, you know, I, I can see her list a ton of guys, but, man, I, I Anthony Poindexter, to me, is one of the best – college coaches and recruiters in the nation. He doesn't sit there and try to kiss their butts. He just kind of coaches and tells it how it is. He comes in our, no matter where he's been, he's been in our school, whether he was at UVA, whether he was at Purdue, now at, at Penn state, he comes in our school and he understands what Virginia football is all about. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't I'm leaving out. I really liked Vance vice when he was at Virginia tech. I liked Vance. He would, he would come in no matter what he recruited our running back, uh, you know, La La uh, uh, Elijah Davis at one point, but he was there when I didn't have any kids. Um, I think that's the thing. You know, these coaches only come in when you have kids. You kind of see their true colors right away. But if they're there no matter what every single year, that school's in there no matter what, that means something. And, and eventually you're going to have kids. Yeah. I and mean, now Coach Rocco is the head coach at VMI, and he's got Coach Steinspring <laughs> on the staff. I mean, I mean, VMI has been good. You know, Coach yeah. Wackenheim did a great job. So now, yeah. I mean, in VMI, they really took a lot of guys who the other schools didn't take. And they really – I mean, do you think that that maybe college coaches are too caught up on the size? And, oh. you know, you, would not guys not, you know, not – this guy's not a great – just getting great football players. Here's the thing, man. If they don't pass the if they don't pass the, the I test A or they don't have certain eight, they don't check boxes, they have no chance. And unfortunately, I do think that it is bad. I mean, you know, uh, I think sometimes kids, you know, uh, fall through the cracks with that. Um, at the end of the day, I guess to answer your question, I think yes. But, you know, at the same time, their jobs are on the line. They're going to recruit based on A, I got to win. And number one, now, more importantly, got to win now. If you don't win now, you're not getting three years anymore. You're going to oh, have yeah. to win You now. recruit your contract. So, I mean, yep. position you coach got to win your contract. And I think that another thing, like you just said, I think the transfer portal, the NILs, all that kind of stuff plays into, you know, what colleges do recruiting-wise. I don't think a lot of times colleges, um, you know, they're, they're not putting near as much time and effort into recruiting high school kids. They're going through that portal. And I get it. You're going to get a quarterback out of the portal. It's already played college football. It's already developed. Whether I take this kid from high school, I might have to develop him for a year, and he won't be able to play for me for a couple of years. Don't have, might not have a couple of years, you know. And uh, and it is what it is, man. I, and you know, I, I I think it's a hard job. You know, we have a hard job. I think they got a hard job. Yeah. Um, 
it, 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 you know, I've seen it. College coaches get way too much credit and, and way too much blame. And I, I, they make a lot of money, and it's kind of gotten out of hand in that situation. But I've also seen it where, you know, you got some college coaches out there, especially assistant coaches, just trying to make it, man. And it's great when you're in it, but when you're out of it and you got to scramble to find a job and you got to scramble to get your kids and where they're going to go to school and doing this and that, it's a tough business. It's a tough business. It's becoming a harder business every and every day. Yeah, so we got six people tuned in. If y'all have anything you want to ask, Coach, go to YouTube, go to the live stream. But, Coach, we've almost been on here for two hours, yeah. man. Yeah. Ain't that crazy? Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, we just been talking. We haven't talked to any X's and O's or anything. But uh, is there anything that you would like to leave? You know, the 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 next generation. You know, just like the guys passed the torch to you, and you were the young coach. Is there anything you would like to leave to the younger generation of coaches that are out there, some wisdom you know, before uh, you we know, get off here? My coaches, Herbie says all the time, you can't cut corners. You can't cheat this game. If you cheat this game, this game's going to come back and bite you in the ass. Um, you can't cheat it preparing. You can't cheat it and, um, you know, do things that you shouldn't be done. You can't cheat it with the way you treat your kids. You can't cheat the game. It's a, <laughs> it's a great game. And I don't know any other way. I think, you know, my, my thing is I get it. There's all kinds of this technology out there. You can put on your wrist and you can do this and you can do that. And, you know, you I can send my stuff to huddle and they can break it down for me. Well, guess what? I can do that, too. I got assistant coaches to get paid to do that. Right. I got myself to do that. And um, I just feel like, man, you got you, you, you got to You got to treat the game the way it's supposed to be treated. You got to respect the game. And there's no shortcuts. We have a process and that process is a lot of hours. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of sweat. It's a lot of blood. Uh, it's it's just a lot of work goes into what we do, and I think if you ever think you can shortcut this game, you're gonna get you're gonna get a rude awakening because it's one thing you can't do is cheat football. And I think again, it's a great example of you can't cheat life. You can't you keep trying to get the shortcuts in life. Eventually, it's gonna come back to haunt you. And uh, I think this is the greatest thing about the game. If you're gonna be one of those coaches that cheat the game and you try to get shortcuts, you might win here, you might win there, you might win this year, you might win that year. You're not gonna win consistently. And, uh, you know, that's one of the biggest things that I've been proud of. We've been able to win consistently. Uh, but more importantly, we, we stay with what we believe in and we stay with the process and we don't change the process. We feel like it's a good process and it's been a successful process. Amen, Coach. Right, if you I guys know what you want to say, Coach, because it's been, it's been awesome talking to you. No, man. I appreciate you having me on, man. I yeah, appreciate I, it. I, I don't I, talk to you enough. I have no idea. Now I'm going to have to figure out what I'm going to do for dinner. But other than that, I think I might have to make a run to Chipotle after this. Yeah, brother. Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate you having me.